So generally, I'm an optimistic guy, uh, as, as I think you may have picked up on. I uh, am, am a cheerleader for the, for the industry, an unapologetic cheerleader for the industry. I love parks and I love attractions and I love coasters. That is Arthur Levine, and you're listening to the Tomorrow Society Podcast. <laughs> Hey there, thanks for joining me here on episode 217 of the Tomorrow Society podcast. I am your host, Dan Heaton. When I thought about who would be the right person to dive into all the exciting new attractions coming to Disney, Universal, regional parks, everything, there was really just one choice, and that is Arthur Levine, who's such an expert on all aspects of the theme park industry. We've been writing about and covering the industry for so long for About.com, USA Today, all these publications, and then also currently still writes for his About Theme Parks newsletter. Arthur is such a fan of the industry, but also thinks smartly about it. And I really enjoyed the chance to talk with him, learn a little bit more about his background, and also to dive into so many cool new attractions coming this year. Here is Arthur Levine. Well, I'm here with one of the true experts on the world of theme parks, coasters, and more. He was the theme park's guide for many years at About.com. He's written for USA Today, Vox Media, so many other publications. He has a newsletter now called About Theme Parks, where he talks about everything happening around the world. It is Arthur Levine. Arthur, thank you so much for talking with me here. It's my pleasure, Dan. I'm, I'm looking forward to this, and, uh, and I appreciate the invitation. Oh, definitely. I've heard you on so many shows over the years, Coaster Radio, Season Pass, you know, recently, Very Music, so many shows. And I'm like, I want to talk to someone about what are some of the cool attractions coming in 2024? I was like, Arthur seems like the right guy. But before we do that, I know you've talked about your background a lot on shows, but I'd love if people aren't familiar, like how you got interested in kind of your role of covering this crazy industry. <laughs> Well, I've been doing it for, for over 30 years now. Actually, it's coming up in 33 years, I think. And like like all kids, I I, I think, I, I adored amusement parks and theme parks, but I, I kind of took it to the next level. In fact, my earliest memories, my very earliest memories, I'm talking about pre-toddler, I'm talking about <laughs> like literally my earliest memories, lived in Massachusetts my entire life, uh, save a, a short stint in college in Connecticut. Used to love to go to Revere Beach, which is the first public beach in the United States. It was the Boston area's answer to Coney Island and, and other seaside amusement parks. Um, it had all kinds of wonderful uh, amusements. I said was because sadly it no longer has the amusements. The beach is still there, but the amusements are, are long gone. Um, but I remember sitting on that beach and with my back to the ocean facing the um the amusements and watching the roller coaster and watching the double ferris wheel and watching the bumper cars for hours on end and being mesmerized by this and and i'm talking about you know this is like i'm like one or two years old <laughs> and then of course as i got older i just loved going there and there's just something about parks that calls out to me it's and and i, I can't really explain it but i've always had this passion Later in life, I wanted to try to figure out a way to combine my passion with my my vocation. Rather than going into the long, boring story about how it all came about, <laughs> I ended up working for a magazine, writing the cover story. There, there used to be a magazine called Theme Park Magazine, and I ended up writing the cover story for the debut issue of Theme Park Magazine, which was about the Back to the Future attraction mm. at Universal Studios Florida. And I was off to the races after that. Um, I was able to you know, take this this incredible passion that I had and turn it into uh, my work. So as you mentioned at the top, uh, after writing for that magazine, I eventually wrote online for about.com and for many years wrote for USA Today. 
uh, and other publications. And I just absolutely love doing it. And I feel very privileged uh, to be able to do something that I love for, for, for my work. So that's kind of the story. I think I could connect with really enjoying parks, you know, as it's, I know remember doing it when I was one or two years old, but I'm sure it probably was there. But I think, I think that's great. Well, what you're doing right now is interesting to me because, you know, you're providing reviews of rides, you're writing about what's happening in the industry. And, you know, you've been releasing recently articles in your newsletter, which you called about theme parks. So I'm curious kind of what got you to decide to do this where, you know, you have a free version, a subscription version and everything else that um, you kind of are going this route um, and what you've enjoyed about it. You know, I said I've been doing this for for well over 30 years. When I started, um, it, some of your listeners will be horrified to hear this, uh, and, and it, it really kind of dates me, but um, there was no such thing as YouTube or Google or a lot of the things that we take for granted now. In fact, there really was no internet, uh, at least not at scale, back when I started. So when I was writing, it was all for print publications. And um, and then I went on to write online and 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 for for uh, for different uh, online and print publications. But as a journalist, I've seen the industry evolve dramatically. Um, I'm, I'm sure it would come as no surprise to you or to the folks listening to this that you know the the uh, newspapers and and uh, the press has has contracted incredibly, and uh, small papers are are. Local newspapers are are closing at alarming rates, and uh, just the whole news industry has been turned on its head. And and I've been kind of caught up in this. Um, it just got to the point where it was not sustainable for me to continue writing for traditional media. Um, and so that's why I turned to Substack, which is a completely different model, as you said, is it, it's a subscriber model. So rather than trying to trying to compete for eyeballs and and maybe have clickbaity headlines and things like that at Substack the focus is on the subscriber the reader and the writer people come because they want to get my content not because I've lured them in with some crazy headline or or uh, SEO trickery and, uh, and 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 I've been loving it. I've been doing this for for a couple of years now. I've got like-minded people, people who are interested in theme parks, come to subscribe to my newsletter, which I would highly encourage folks to do. I would imagine everybody here loves theme parks, and uh, and they can do that by going to um, about theme parks. That's a b o u t theme parks dot fun. Um, I didn't know that there was a a URL. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a suffix uh, fu one but there is. So it's about themeparks.fun. And as you said, people can subscribe for free or they can become a paid subscriber. There are no ads. Um, the goal isn't to sell anything here. It's just to support quality journalism. And um, for us uh, readers and, 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 and me as a writer to kind of share our, our passion. So that's what I've been doing for, uh, for the past couple of years. I, I also write for um, IAPA, the trade organization. I write for Fun World Magazine. I have a column there and I write features and I also write online for them. And that's primarily what, I, what I'm doing these days. That's where folks can find me. Well, awesome. Yeah. And I, I may definitely make a pitch for the newsletter, especially because I know that people that listen to this show are interested in kind of that level of fandom, but also just um, quality journalism. So speaking of that, though, because I know I mentioned you started looking forward to 2024, and that is what we're going to do here today. And so before, I'm, we're going to dive into things for all over the world, Disney Universal and other parks, but not to even a specific ride, but like what is exciting you right now as you look ahead to the year we're going to experience in the parks or even just the industry? Like what's kind of a trend or something that you're enjoying? I'm going to approach this a little differently um, than than just maybe what's exciting me about this year and 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 what trends I'm seeing, and, and say that we're going to talk about a lot of things, and there are a lot of exciting things happening this year. However, I would say that this is it's kind of an unusual year, 2024, um, and I think it's a result of the pandemic. You know, there were a lot of uh, attractions and developments um, that had been planned but were delayed because of the pandemic. And they've slowly kind of trickled out. And I think 
pretty much all of those attractions and and lands and shows have have debuted also because of the pandemic i think a lot of parks and owners and operators were a little nervous about committing capital to new uh new attractions new things as a result i think in 2024 we're not really seeing a lot of major uh attractions or and or lands or things like that at least here in, in the in the united states um it's more incremental we're seeing a lot of remakes and uh updates to existing attractions and and just sort of incremental changes um especially at the large destination parks disney and universal there are some new coasters opening and we're going to talk about that i i, I believe and um and some other things happening so so it, it it's kind of a funny year, 2024. On the other hand, what excites me, to get back to your original question, is what the future holds. Because looking at Universal and Disney and really all media companies, they're really struggling these days uh, in general. You know, the movie business was thrown a, an incredible curveball during the pandemic. The, you know, the uh, attendance and ticket sales just took a dive and have yet to really fully recover. And and I think they're just struggling there. Not to mention the the, the strikes that we had that really uh put a damper on on new production. Um, and then you look at broadcast television, uh, the strike certainly had an impact there and the, and the media landscape is just changing uh, in general so that broadcast television certainly isn't the powerhouse that it once was. And then you look at streaming, that burned brightly, especially during the pandemic, but I think um, it's been shown that that incredible model of growth is not sustainable. So you know the major media companies are really struggling to sort of find their way through um through all of these changes however the one bright spot with universal and disney especially are the theme parks uh they're doubling tripling quadrupling down on them i i know that you you've seen this and everybody listening to this i'm sure has heard this that disney is committing 60 billion dollars over the next 10 years to theme parks and, and it's funny, again, not to date me, but I remember <laughs> when Epcot opened, and this is the early 1980s. Yeah. And I remember there was a Life magazine. And again, a lot of people are probably like, well, what the heck's Life magazine? But I remember there was a Life magazine cover about Epcot. And I think the headline was something like Disney's $1 billion gamble. And <laughs> uh, in other words, it, it, it cost roughly $1 billion to build the entire Epcot, which was a pretty considerable park. and and. The Life magazine headline was putting this uh, in in such a way as to say, like, can you believe that they spent a billion dollars on on one park? So I know that you know from the early '80s to now, uh, there's been inflation and a lot of things have changed. But sixty billion dollars is not chump change. I mean, that's that's a lot of bucks, and so that has me excited. And then we look at Universal, Epic Universe opening not in 2024 but in 2025 looks absolutely incredible and stunning and we just heard uh that the um that universal apparently is looking at opening a major park in the uk and then they've got their smaller parks that they're working on which i know we're going to be talking about so all of these things have me incredibly excited not necessarily for 2024 but <laughs> about the industry in general one trend i did want to mention that does have me excited for 2024 is this trend to micro parks uh so called micro parks so uh, i think later in 2024 we're going to see the opening of mattel adventure park in arizona looks like it's going to be great um but it it's it's like 9 acres mostly indoors and um, and we're seeing a lot of these much smaller scale parks. Peppa Pig Park is also going to right. be opening in uh, in Texas um, after they opened uh, the one in, in Florida next to Legoland. I was at Kathmandu Park in Punta Cana uh, earlier in 2023 uh, when it opened. Uh, so we're seeing we're seeing this more and more that you know in the U.S. especially it's a mature market. There really isn't a lot of room for growth. Epic Universe, notwithstanding, I don't know how many more parks at that scale we're going to see open in in the country. But micro parks, I think, are 
kind of filling the void and it's it's in uh, micro parks and standalone attractions as, as well it's it's a different way to experience e-ticket level attractions uh experiences at a, at a much smaller scale and at a much smaller price um with much lower expectations you know you, you can you can open a park like peppa pig and you don't necessarily have to have tens of millions of people to make it profit profitable so that's a trend that i'm seeing and um we will see some some action uh to that end in in 2024 and and that has me excited oh yeah you've hit on like so many different things i could ask you about but i it, it is tempting to want to just kind of look ahead and talk about epic universe and talk about 2025 but even like you said the micro parks idea is just so interesting like you know the universal with them opening going to open the family park in frisco and then also the halloween horror nights i don't know if i call it a park but you know facility yep. in vegas yep. so um you know we got let me ask you about that before we dive into some of the other things i mean you mentioned that that's a trend that's you know like the mattel park and everything yes um i'm a little nervous because i feel like i mean we've seen it with meow wolf too with some of the amazing things they've done i mean how far could this go like is there any concern that we're going to run into situations like the hard rock park or even like lost island which is really having a challenge in iowa which i hope continues to like you know is that the future from what you've seen i mean or is it still going to have to take someone with like the universal type budget to really succeed there there's a lot of questions there (laughs) a lot of questions let me see if i can unpack some of it um does it necessarily take uh a company with the resources of universal to build a successful micropark i don't think so um and i can point to things like um i got to experience for the first time in 2023 uh wings over washington which is this standalone attraction in in uh in washington that is a flying theater attraction. And there are examples of this in other parts of the of the country as well. There's a flying theater attraction in Vegas. There's one that I went to in Pigeon Forge. And they seem to be doing quite well. Um, Wings Over Washington, especially with the pre-show and with animatronics and with media. I mean, they did just such a great job. It really is. If, if you pick that up and dropped it into you know, Disney World or Universal, you'd be right at home. And it 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 indicates to me that there is a market for, for this, that people crave this kind of entertainment. They don't necessarily want to get on a plane uh, and go to Florida or go to California to experience attractions like this. Um, and so I, I think that it is feasible and it is viable. Will there be some failures? Uh, sure, that's that's a possibility. But I think that the the concept holds a lot of great hope. That's a great point. Yeah, and I've I've seen videos. I have not been to Wings Over Washington, but it looks that's a great example of how it could work. Well, let's dive in here with Disney, which. You know, like you said, Disney, most of the things they're doing in 2024, for the most part, are updates or other changes. And even their big thing, which I want to ask you about, is the revamp of Splash Mountain, which, again, we don't know when, you know, probably late in the year, but Disneyland, Disney World, Tiana's Bayou Adventure. So, I mean, I know this is their big flagship attraction of the year that in the United States, different and different. We're going to talk about another bigger thing, Yep. but how interested are you in this, um, in terms of this attraction and what it might be beyond just a removing elements of splash mountain? I'm very excited about it. Um, it was the changing. The theme was long overdue. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> I'm glad that they finally done it, but for crying out loud, what took so long? And, it's great to learn that it's not just sort of slapping on some paint or, you know, dressing up what's already there. It's my understanding that it's going to be entirely new animatronics. Um, you know, a lot of the animatronics that are in Splash Mountain were repurposed from America Sings from from years right. ago. <laughs> um, so it, it's great to know that it'll be entirely new, not just new 
animatronics, but uh, you know, just incorporating the latest animatronic technology as well. So I think they'll be much more fluid and you know the kinds of things that we've seen Disney do lately. The original voice actors are going to be involved in um, in the attraction. I know that there's been a lot of noise and 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 some negativity about um, changing the theme. Um, you know, the, as as there is about virtually everything in this crazy divided nation that we live in, <laughs> it, it seems. Um, I suspect that all of that will go away uh, the moment that it opens, um, not unlike Guardians of the Galaxy Mission yeah. Breakout. You know, there was so much uh, clutching of pearls and, and fretting that was going on back then. And literally the day it opened, it was like, oh, my God, this thing is fabulous. <laughs> um, I think people are going to love it. Keep in mind, it's the same ride system, the same thrills, the same amount of splash and wet and screaming and all the things that that everybody loved about Splash Mountain. You know, they're still going to be able to experience that just with a, a, a new theme, a new compelling theme, I think. And, and, and again, one that's long overdue. So I'm very excited about it. Yeah, me too. And I I love Splash Mountain as it's as a ride, you know, not I have no connection to the source material, but I'm super excited for this. Even with how much I enjoyed it, I'm like everything I'm hearing about it, like you said, makes it this is not this is not even a Frozen Ever After from Maelstrom type change. This seems to be a lot more involved than that where That's they're right. doing they're really putting it into it and I think I think it's going to be great. I think I th I'm excited also too. You know, I you said the same splash at Disneyland. I might like a little less. That's all I will say because I've been very soaked there recently. I will say, but I I I'm excited about it. I think it's going to be super cool. Well, Disney is also doing some smaller updates, and I'm not. Gonna, I don't know if we're going to talk about each one, but I'm curious, kind of what interests you the most. We've got. You know, the change to Test Track, kind of sponsor pushed, I think, which I think looks cool. A new Country Bear Jamboree. I mean, same animatronics, but new songs. And then Star Tours Destination. So they're doing a lot of kind of changes like that. Of this kind of list, I mean, what interests you about those in terms of um, something new for theme parks? In terms of 2024, I'm not sure about Test Track. I don't know that it's necessarily going to open in 2024. You're right. It might be next year. I know they may close it at this time. That's a good point. Yeah, although it might be. I I think that they haven't been very specific. Um, in fact, mm -hmm. I was at Destination D23 at Disney World when they made these announcements. And um, while it got everybody all excited when they talked about these things, it, they were very sparse with the details. So yeah. um, I think the Test Track revamp sounds interesting to me as as you said it's probably sponsor driven i think it probably has to do with um chevrolet's contract requirements to maybe invest money in this every 10 years or something mm -hmm. like that and, and you know they're talking about it being um taking inspiration from world of motion and the 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 sense of optimism that that attraction uh engendered and i i, I think that um that sounds great it'll probably be based more in maybe a near future reality than the the trony kind of yeah. uh, vibe that that test track has now star tours you know that that seems like a pretty minor update yeah. uh, and 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 one that kind of uh, calls out to Disney's uh, need for synergy to kind of promote, um, you know, the the Disney Plus streaming channel. Country Bear Jamboree, th that one kind of probably excites me more than any. You know, it's 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 a, a long in the tooth attraction that uh, could use <laughs> an update. Uh, it's kind of interesting the direction they're taking. You know, they're going to be reinterpreting Disney's classical disney classic songs as in, in, in the country music genre and and it's going to have this grand old opry uh vibe to it i guess i'm looking forward to that i think it it uh you know how many times can you see the same dang show <laughs> year after year after year um so i'm i i i, I think it's great and, and that one will be opening in 2024 at least according to disney and so i'm looking forward to that yeah, yeah, I may have jumped the gun on on Test Track, but I'm so interested in Country Bear Jamboree just because, I mean, I'm happy it's not being closed because I feel like that's always been a possibility. And the fact that, you know, when I was a kid, I always saw the vacation version because I was always there in the summer and it was always that one. So they've had different overlays. It's just nothing to this level. But my hope is that 
they maybe will do a few updates to the animatronics or at least make them make sure they work. And they've already updated the sound, which is much better. But I'm hoping they'll give kind of the entire show, which they've done fairly recently, but you know, a little bit more of a refresh than just the music. So I, I, the good news is I think that this will mean the show will probably last. I mean, I would think for a while based with this kind of change, especially connecting it to Disney, I hate to say Disney IP probably means it's going to be safe for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's a great point Dan. that it's one of the few um, attractions that, that that's getting some love that isn't related to some uh, IP. This is this is a, a a Disney theme park original back in the day when they used to do that kind of stuff, uh, which they, they don't seem to be too fond of doing anymore. Um, so it's great to see that um, it is not only not on the chopping block, but getting some love, which is which is great. Yeah. Well, speaking of IP, I mentioned it a minute ago. The big expansion that I think is going to probably make some of us here in the States be a little jealous (laughs) is fantasy Springs at Tokyo Disney sea, which I mean, not just lands based on frozen tangled and Peter Pan, a new hotel, multiple attractions that, I mean, the frozen one I suspect will somehow, you know, be similar maybe to the new one in Hong Kong, but tangled and Peter Pan, these are brand new attractions. I mean, Am I too excited? Because I'm looking at this going like, wow, this could be something really special, this whole new land at what's already possibly one of the greatest, if not, you know, top notch Disney parks. I think you've hit on everything that I wanted to say about it, Dan. That <laughs> sorry, uh, no, 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 no. That that's absolutely fine. It just shows we're we're thinking, we're we're of like mind here. I mean, Tokyo Disney Sea, I I have not been. I'm 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 embarrassed to say. Me neither, sadly. Yeah, yeah. And I hope to get there someday. But certainly everything that you and I and everybody else has has heard about it, has read about it, has seen about it online, it is, you know, perhaps the greatest theme park in the world. What probably most folks know is that uh Disney does not own Tokyo Disneyland. Um, it is owned by the Oriental Land Company, which seems to have incredibly deep pockets just <laughs> yes no matter what they do it's at a level that just <laughs> exceeds almost anything we get here in the states uh and and so yeah there were there already was a level of jealousy and and uh uh fear of missing out and and it seems a little cruel to take what perhaps might be the best theme park in the world that everybody kind of lusts after and then drop this into it, (laughs) uh, which probably more than anything around the world, I would say is, you know, that this is what excites me the most. This, this is the, this is the, you know, the, 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 the grand slam that we would hope to see everywhere. It seems to be happening in Tokyo this year. Disney does not release budgets, but man, this looks like, you know, it's going to, suck up a considerable amount of that 60 billion dollars oh yeah how much of that 60 billion is this included in or is it before they started counting it, it's 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 unclear but i would imagine that <laughs> it probably includes this i don't know that that the frozen ride is necessarily based on frozen ever after mm. even even the plus version that just opened in hong kong it looks to me like it might be something entirely different uh it's for one thing it's called anna and elsa's frozen right. journey not frozen and ever after um whatever it is again just looking at <laughs> tokyo disneyland's track record it's probably going to be extraordinary um as is the ride uh in rapunzel's forest which is the tangled uh, area um which is going to be a boat ride based on um a romantic scene from that movie between uh between rapunzel and flynn rider I, again we don't have a lot of details but they look great what what's a little Confusing to me is the Peter Pan's Neverland area, which will have a ride as well, which is being described as a 3D uh, ride uh, in in which John will be rescued from Captain Hook. What is confusing to me is that Tokyo Disneyland already has Peter Pan's flight. And so it just seems a little strange how how they're going to differentiate the two attractions, how you sort of retell that story and the fact that Peter Pan has a presence in both parks, although that's it's not unprecedented. I mean, we, we've seen that with Harry Potter and other IPs, but I just found that a little strange, I guess, um, but also a, a little wonderful that uh, an IP as 
old and as classic as Peter Pan is is deemed worthy of of having uh, its own little mini land uh, in this in this area. So yeah, this has me real excited. And and as I said, I think this is probably you know the thing to really kind of focus on in 2024. I mean, that's the thing, Peter Pan. I mean, the movie came out in the early 1950s. And the fact that they're having another new land plus, you know, a ready Peter Plant's flight is is pretty impressive. And even the fact, that, yeah, I mean, I kind of made assumptions about Frozen, but you're right, it has a different name. And again, it's kind of like when they they just did that Beauty and the Beast dark ride, which is so impressive from what I've seen in the Tokyo Disneyland Park. So yeah. if some of these have that level of animatronics, and I know that's trackless, but you know, I I can't wait. But I'm curious too. You mentioned, you know, them having the same, you know, in the same resort when Disney, I mean, they've been so vague with their beyond big thunder ideas. You mentioned destination 23, Mm -hmm. and then we hear a lot about Disneyland forward in California and they have all that information. Assuming I'm not asking you to predict and say what will happen, but to me, it doesn't seem like a huge stretch to think that if they would move forward with something like that, that some part of this fantasy springs or a really cool attraction or ride system might end up at one of those areas i think that's a very fair assumption yeah Yeah. and disney certainly has shown that you know if they're going to put in the research and development into something uh, why not repurpose it especially if it um if it gets a great reaction which i'm assuming it probably will cool well let's switch gears to universal and I have a very long list of things overall, so I don't want to spend too much time on this, but briefly, they are opening a new DreamWorks land, which is replacing the kids area that had like Curious George and, you know, Five Ol, I think. I'm trying to remember all the different, they had a little coaster too, but I mean- Woody Woodpecker. Yeah, Woody Woodpecker. (laughs) um, Haven't (laughs) haven't spent as much time in the kids area there as at Disney, but how much, I mean- Just overall, how much do you expect from this? You know, I know they're going to retheme that coaster and then they're going to have like Shrek and Trolls and some of the big, um, big DreamWorks properties. But how much do you expect this to be as far as excitement there, I guess? Again, um, as as I was mentioning earlier, this is more sort of incremental change, not major change. Um, certainly not something on the level of Epic Universe <laughs> that will be opening no. <laughs> the, the following year. So, you know, it's a relatively minor change to an area that has been fairly stagnant for, for quite a while. And, you know, I how many kids even know who Fievel is these days or, or Woody Woodpecker <laughs> for that matter? Um, I, I don't know that there are many. So it's an area that that needed some some updates, I think. And Universal's never been shy about uh, changing out things. Um, you mentioned Shrek. You mentioned Trolls. Uh, it, I, I think in the Curious George area, there's going to be Kung Fu Panda. Uh, will probably be the the third IP there. And we're we're talking about things like play spaces re-theming uh, Woody Woodpecker's Nuthouse Coaster to probably Trolls. I've heard the name Troller Coaster. Uh, <laughs> indeed about that may be the name. Who knows? Uh, it, it'll be a relatively minor change, but one that will be that that will speak to uh, younger kids um, you know, better than what is there now. And, and, uh, again, giving it some much needed attention and and updates, I think. Yeah. I like to see that. I think, I mean, not that I'm connected as much to those properties, but I wasn't really, I think Barney was there (laughs) for a while. So yeah, I don't think I'm connected that much with that either, but I shouldn't, shouldn't waste any more time. I mean, I know it's not 2024, but we have to at least briefly talk about Epic universe here, which, we're starting to see construction and then there's, there's, you know, great work done by like Alicia Stella and then, you know, bio reconstruct some of the people that are really giving us all this info, but you know, I know we're excited about this, but I look at it and think, oh my gosh, a brand new park. We haven't had a new Disney or universal park in the United States since, um, you know, around the time when we had animal kingdom and Isles adventure and all of that to yep. have that come in. I mean, I'm expecting this to just blow me away. How high of expectation should I have on this based on everything we know? I think you should have really high expectation. I'm glad you mentioned Alicia Stella, by the way. She's just doing incredible work. Oh, yeah. I, I, she, she, uh, I mean, it's, it's one thing to have 
to have uh, resources and to have um, contacts and, and so forth. But she obviously puts in an incredible amount of work and and uh, and 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 is is to be applauded. I think we all of us should be incredibly excited about it. Um, it looks to me like Universal is just um, you know sp- sparing no expense uh, and and kind of throwing every technological trick theme park trick in the book <laughs> at this and and things that we haven't even seen uh done yet so i'm i'm extremely extremely excited about it and one one way that we can get excited about it because they've been you know quite vague uh alicia stella notwithstanding universal itself hasn't really been very forthcoming with with details however um, they have um, let the cat out of the bag a bit about Donkey Kong Country at um, Universal Studios uh, in, in Japan. You know, there will be um, a Nintendo um, land uh, at Epic Universe as well, and it will have reportedly a, a Donkey Kong Country as well. And the Minecart Madness coaster that they are talking about for japan which will surely be cloned at uh in, in orlando looks pretty wild and and if we could just talk about it just just a little bit mm-hmm. many years ago probably talking about 10 15 maybe even more years ago there was this company was pitching this concept of the cantilevered coaster and the idea was that the trains that are on the track that are visible are really being there's an actual track underneath the apparent one where the real work is being done. And by doing that and by having the uh, chassis hidden from view and, and underneath the actual track, the train on top could do things that would appear to defy physics, like, you know, leap over um, <laughs> missing track and and things like that, because uh, th- there's actually this this track underneath. Well, nothing ever came of that until now. And, and it looks like Universal is doing exactly that, having this cantilevered concept where there's an actual track hidden from view underneath. And just like the Donkey Kong video game, um, the train is apparently going to look like it's going to jump track. And, you know, people will be able to watch this and and logically know that, you know, Universal is not going to be putting them <laughs> in any grave <laughs> danger. And yet, I think just um, as, as we experience this and you're on the train and you're looking ahead and you see that there's a gap in the track, you're like, oh, my God, I'm going to die. <laughs> uh, because it literally is going to be just floating apparently on air for a few moments when in fact it's really connected to this track you know hidden from view it's brilliant it's just such a great application of this concept and will you know allow people to live out their donkey kong video game fantasies <laughs> uh, so that alone has me excited not to mention everything else that um, will be happening at Epic Universe, which just looks mind blowing and mind boggling. It's great we have that preview um, with it opening sooner because Donkey Kong Country is supposed to open in 2024. In 2024. Whereas, right. you know, Epic Universe is going to, it's kind of like how they had their Nintendo World open, even though it wasn't the same before Universal Hollywood did. And everyone kind of got to look at it. And actually, my only issue, I went to Nintendo Land in Hollywood, was it was so small yeah. and so cramped. Right. Where I'm excited about Big Universe being able to get there. And one, they're, I think they're going to have the Yoshi ride, is my understanding. I mean, they haven't said for sure, but that seems to be the impression. Yeah. It'll be more like Japan right. with all three. And the sad thing is, is like, like you said, this sounds incredible. This would be enough almost to get me excited. It's like, oh, by the way, there's this monsters area with some crazy <laughs> dark ride now. Oh, and then there's Harry Potter with the Ministry of Magic. And oh, wait, there's this other coaster and there's how to train. It's like, oh my gosh, my brain can only handle so much. Arthur. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're not used to this, Dan. I mean, you know, it's, it's like you said, it's been years since we've had a major park open here in the United States. And to have all of that all at once. And by the way, we're talking about, we're previewing 2024 with the pace at which Universal is building this. I wouldn't be surprised if um, we don't see some previews of Epic Universe late in 2024. I, I wouldn't be surprised if October, November, maybe while people are down there for Halloween Horror Nights. So, by the way, 
Um, oh my God! Ma- maybe not everything, you know. Maybe one certain land. lands. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I've say I've heard that they could that for corporate stuff, yeah. they're going to try and make it where they can cut each land off. Right. right. We were thinking the exact same thought. Yeah. That, that's <laughs> right. So w- wouldn't it be great to um, to put that into practice by having a preview of maybe just the Monsters Land or maybe just Nintendo or whatever? I wouldn't be surprised at all if that happens. And um, as a member of the media, I certainly hope that I get to <laughs> get the invite yeah. to experience some of that uh that uh and, and it may happen in 2024 i need to work to figure out how to get on that list like start now and just see like what can i do because oh my gosh arthur that would be be amazing well i hate to even move on i could just go on for a while on that i wanted you briefly mentioned this kind of transition time and i think that leads well into what's happening at some of the other orlando parks and i'm um, kind of i'm going to put these together but both by sea world parks and entertainment they have Phoenix Rising coming to Busch Gardens, Tampa, and then Penguin Trek coming to Sea Orlando, which is kind of replacing the uh, unfortunate Antarctica um, trackless em- ride there. Yeah. Um, so Empire of the Penguin. Empire of the Penguin. Yes, yeah. so I want to make sure to give that wonderful attraction it's due. But I mean, I'm curious, just kind of in general, like what maybe interests you about these two, and also kind of the way that. It really seems like, I mean, with SeaWorld especially, they just keep opening new coasters there. <laughs> and it just seems to continue that way. And then Bush Gardens, they have, you know, Iron Gwazi was such a hit, but now they're kind of filling in a gap by replacing a very old coaster. Yeah. Be- before we talk about these specific ones, just to amplify yeah. your point, um, yes, um, SeaWorld is really putting an emphasis on um, new coasters and opening them at a furious pace. I mean, it's just crazy that year after year after year, it wasn't that long ago that SeaWorld Orlando had zero roller coasters. Right. Um, and, and then, um, but, you know, lately they're opening one a year. And uh, neither of the, the, the two coasters at, uh, at SeaWorld Orlando or Busch Gardens Tampa are, are, are major, major coasters. These are, are family coasters. They, um, they, they both are, are in sort of the 40 mile per hour range. Mm-hmm. They're going to be accessible to younger kids. I don't know exactly what the height requirements are. But it's, you know, they're probably kids as young as four or five or six will probably be able to get on these uh, depending on mm-hmm. how tall they are. And um, the one that is in um, Bush Gardens, which is Phoenix Rising, is um, a family inverted coaster. And so an inverted coaster is one in which the trains hang from the track above and you're kind of in you're kind of in um, ski. Oh, gosh, I, I, I've forgotten the name now. The the uh, <laughs> the things that go up uh, ski lift. It's it's kind of like, uh, yeah. you know, that 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 kind of a uh, of a of a car. Uh, so your feet are dangling and you're hanging from the track above. There won't be any inversions. Track will be a launched coaster. You'll be on snowmobile type vehicles. And um, like the attraction that it's replacing, um, which was kind of a weird attraction. I don't know if you ever got to ride that, but it was it was one of the first trackless trackless dock rides, and it was it was it was kind of undercooked and 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 just <laughs> just kind of yeah. weird. And, and it, very strange. It, yeah, it was it was kind of a strange ride. But like that ride, um, this coaster will end up inside the penguin exhibit and where it's very cold in there because penguins like it, you know, really cold. And it's kind of neat, I think, to combine, you know, this mechanical ride with live animals. Uh it's 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 unusual. And I think um hopefully it'll be, you know, nicely themed. So I think, you know, maybe not the coaster part of it in and of itself may not be like, you know, getting me overly excited. But the fact that it might be themed well and tie in with the Penguin exhibit that's there, I think, makes it more intriguing to me. Same here. Yeah, I love the idea of them kind of ending with the Penguins and then possibly, hopefully they're able to theme it pretty well. Well, speaking of theming. I'm in St. Louis, and I was able to get to Silver Dollar City last year to do the final rides. <laughs> I think I did four of them on Fire in the Hole, which um, I have a soft spot for. Have ridden it for many years over my life, and I love the idea of what they are doing at Silver Dollar City. What Hershend is doing with they closed this long running coaster of more than fifty years, but they're creating a new version of it. In a new building, not not an update, a new building, new version. I mean, are my expectations too high? Because I look at this and I think, 
wow, this is going to be a cool kind of hybrid dark ride coaster. Well, here's a way that you can, uh, that we can put a number to your expectations. They've announced that they're spending $30 million on this, which for a regional park is a considerable amount of money. Oh, yeah. And the coaster itself is fairly modest. I mean, we, you know, we're talking about probably a top speed in the, in, in, in the 25 mile an hour range or something like that. It's a, a fairly modest coaster. So most of that money is going to be going into the the show and the theming and the sets. And um, there's going to be apparently 14 scenes uh, for this. And it will retell the story of the 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 burning town, which, by the way, is based on a, a actual events. There really was a mining town at um, where Silver Dollar City is located. To this day, you can go down into the cave and 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 explore where they used to mine the bat guana <laughs> down there. Yeah, I've been there. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently there was this uh, th- this band of uh, no goodniks, the bald knobbers that, that burned the mining town for real back in the day. And that's what they have been recreating in this 51-year-old attraction, Fire in the Hole, and we'll will be uh, redoing, remaking in, in, in the new Fire in the Hole. So, you know, I'm expecting it, it, it. The the original Fire in the Hole, as you know, because you were just there. Yeah. It, love, it, it's a lovely ride. It's it's classic. But it's, you know, quaint. And yeah. <laughs> I mean, is, is one way to describe it. It's pretty uh, rough, too. I will say in the yeah, back, it's the, pretty rough. <laughs> the, the ride was real, real rough. A lot of potholes <laughs> in there. A lot of rough, yeah. rough areas. So... Uh, a company that's called Rocky Mountain Construction is going to be doing the coaster part of this, and they are known for ultra smooth rides. Oh, yeah. So you can you can fully expect this to be a really really smooth ride, especially compared to what was there before. Um, but also, I think we can expect to see some impressive animatronics. Uh, impressive lighting. There's probably going to be some projection mapping. Um, and, you know, a lot of the modern day theme park technology that we know and love at Disney and Universal, I think we're going to see that um, incorporated into this attraction. So I, I keep saying this to you, I guess, but once again, I think I'm going to have to say, no, I don't think your expectations are, are too high. <laughs> I think it's perfectly reasonable to expect that this is going to be great. And um, I can't wait to check it out. I was there for the announcement for this oh, cool. in 2023. And um, I, I certainly hope to go back in 2024 for the opening. And maybe you and I can share a ride on it. Yeah, I, I hope to get out there for the opening. Um, yeah, like I wa- was watching the announcement on Facebook Live. Very, very fancy. Pre- they did a nice presentation, I will say. But um, yeah, RMC being involved, I think, is super cool. Just, you know, they have Outlaw Run at that park, which was done by them, which I know is one of their early coasters, but is still very cool. So just, um, yeah, it's exciting for me living so close, but I also find it very interesting as a theme park fan. Just there's a really the concept art is kind of silly. You mentioned the history where they, they show the coaster going by this burning town Mm -hmm. and all the people in the car are like smiling and happy. And I'm like, (laughs) this is very strange. (laughs) They're very happy about the burning town. Well, Let's talk about red Flanders too. this, this old coot who, who lost his pants and then, and for 51 (laughs) years has never been able to find them. And in the new version, he apparently is still pantless. So yeah, it's a, it's an odd quirky (laughs) kind of uh, kind of story that, that they're telling, but, um, we were talking about this before we started recording. I love Silver Dollar City. Oh, I yeah. mean, I love, love, love Silver Dollar City. Uh, Hershend Entertainment uh, is uh, are the folks that operate that. They also operate Dollywood, which um, used to be called Silver Do- Dollar City back in the day before right. Dolly got involved. Two wonderful, wonderful parks, which, as I was saying to you earlier, occupies this very special place in between Disney Universal and uh, the more regional seasonal parks like Six Flags and, and, and Cedar Fair. Um, really, it's it's I, I would say it's sort of closer to Disney Universal than it is to Six Flags. And what they do is just great. I love Silver Dollar City. I love Dollywood too, for that matter. Uh, but can't wait to see what they're doing with Fire in the Hall next uh, this year. Yeah, it's um I think that park I feel like is moving closer to Disney Universal in the past with things like $30 million investments yeah. and everything else. Yes. They're even more than when I was young. I remember when 
Thunderation opened, which is was their second coaster at the time. I went, I was like in high school or maybe, you know, and they and I went there and that was a really big deal. And now they have surpassed that so many times. <laughs> so, you know, they just keep surpassing it. Well, I also want to ask you about a very silly concept. I'm not going to oversell this one, but I am a short drive from Holiday World, which I speaking of a park that has amazing coasters with their top three, or yeah. I guess you could say now top four. I haven't done Thunderbird, but they're three wooden coasters. They're now going to add a coaster theme to gravy called Good Gravy, <laughs> which um, to me, I think it fills a good gap in their lineup yes. from the kids ride up top. But I'm curious for your thoughts on this a little bit. I wouldn't undersell this too much. Um, I think you're right to, uh, to, to highlight this. This is going to be um, the first, actually the first of two what's known as a uh, Vacoma family boomerang. Vacoma is the company that that manufactures these coasters. And this will be the first two family boomerang coasters in the United States. They have many of these around the world. And so what that means is it's a shuttle coaster. Uh, it doesn't complete a circuit like a traditional coaster. I think initially you're going to be pulled backwards up a spike and then released. And then you'll go forwards and... Um, uh, and, and eventually end up going up a spike at the end, and you'll peter out and then roll backwards and do the entire course backwards. Uh, so that's why it's called a, a boomerang. Vacoma has made a sort of uh, major league boomerang coasters that are at many, many, many parts. Yeah. And uh, they, over the years, have become excessively rough. I would expect this one to be much smoother. Um, but this is toned down. It's it's um, only 1,500 feet, so it's very, very short. Even though it's going to go forwards and backwards and repeat the the course twice, uh, the whole thing is going to be close to a minute and maybe even under a minute. So it's it's quite short. But the reason why I say don't undersell it, for one thing, it is kind of a gateway coaster, which I think you were sort of uh, alluding to. Yeah. For kids who are not able to get on on Holiday World's, you know, bigger wooden coasters, um, but maybe have outgrown, you know, the little kitty coaster that they have. This is a great opportunity for them to experience things like going backwards and going up spikes um, without having, uh, you know, the, the the thrills be too overwhelming. What really has me intrigued is Holiday World has this great tradition, this great history legacy of being kind of silly and having fun yeah. uh, with their with their themes and 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 with their marketing. I, I remember um, years ago interviewing Will Cook, the late Will Cook, mm -hmm. um, who uh, was the owner president of the park. The, the Cook family still owns the park. His kids are kind of carrying on the tradition. And he just was was such a wonderful, fun guy. And, and I, I, I just always enjoyed kind of their aesthetic, their vibe. And but what they're doing with good gravy, which by the way has an exclamation point and it's yes. good gravy with an exclamation mark. <laughs> when you're going through the course, you're going to be going through a giant cranberry sauce can and you're going to be going past some other Thanksgiving props because this isn't the Thanksgiving land at Holiday World. And the queue will be in grandmother's house. You're going to be going into grandmother's house, which is themed to like, you know, late 50s, early 60s or 70s shag carpeting and paneling. And um, so they, they really, uh, you know, rather than just gone for function, you know, they're really looking at the form here and having a lot of fun with it. There's something about Holiday World, not unlike Silver Dollar City, that it just kind of puts a smile on my face just going there because... The customer service is great. The employees are great. The grounds are spotless. Everything is well maintained. And then they have just fun, silly things like good gravy that, you know, they 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 just kind of do everything right. So um, I'm looking forward to that. And, and and by the way, I mentioned that there were two of these coming into the United States next year. The second one will be at uh, Kings Island. And it's going right. to be Snoopy's Soapbox Racers. It'll essentially be the same exact ride where you go backwards and forwards and everything. But instead of being themed to Thanksgiving, it'll be themed to the Peanuts characters. So, so yeah, I visited Kings Island uh, this past year for the first time. Oh, my gosh, I love that park. I could probably, I like Silver Dollar City, I feel like I could just veer off. And I didn't go with my daughters, but I'm excited 
that they have more to that Camp Snoopy area. But I'm going to shift us in a different direction entirely. You mentioned Vacoma Boomerang. I don't like Vacoma Boomerangs. There's one in St. Louis. But at Six Flags Great Adventure, they are building the first um, in the U.S. In the U.S. Vacoma Super Boomerang. Yes. Which called Flash Vertical Velocity, but not the same as the one at Great America. Should we be more excited about this, even if we're not a big fan of your typical boomerang coaster? Yeah, for for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that it um, will surely be much smoother than the aging boomerang coasters that are out there, like at Six Flags St. Louis and at many, many yes. other parks. So that's one reason to be more excited about it. Secondly, instead of using a traditional lift hill, these are going to be launched coasters, uh, specifically a, what's known as a swing launch. So uh, what that means is the um, magnetic motors are going to launch you out of the station forward um, where you will go up a hill and peter out and then roll back and go through those same launch motors, which will then um, launch you backwards up a spike. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> where you will peter out again, and then you'll go forwards again through the uh, through the lo- the the loading station. Again, hit those motors going forward a third time, which will get you up and over the hill finally. And then you'll go through the course, and you're gonna you're gonna go up the other side of that spike that you went backwards to begin with. Um, and and like the family boomerangs that we were talking about, you will then. Um, go through the entire course backwards. I would imagine, as I said, this will be much smoother. The magnetic launches are going to really, you know, kind of grab people's attention uh, rather than a pokey lift hill. Um, so I, I, I think that for, for for those reasons, I think that, uh, yes, we should be excited about it. I don't know if my stomach's excited for that, though. Wow, that <laughs> sounds, that's like Mr. Freeze, but taken to the next level. That's, oh my gosh, that sounds intense, Arthur. I mean, are you able to handle all these coasters very well? I'm just curious for you, having done so many. You know, happily, virtually any coaster that's thrown at me, but for whatever reason, and I don't know what that reason is, but thankfully, um, I am able to handle even spinning rides. Um, as you can oh. tell, as you can tell by looking at me, Dan, I'm so I'm I'm you know getting up there in years, but I still will go with my adult son on spinning rides, and and thankfully I'm able to to handle them. Um, so yes, I am able to handle oh, virtually any coaster I, that that's out there. <laughs> I just thought I'd ask you because um, you know I mean nothing to do with your age. I just know that some of these are pretty intense and like oh spinning rides I don't I don't touch though so I'm usually okay on most coasters. Well, speaking of a thrilling coaster, I think the last one I want to ask you about as far as an individual coaster is at Cedar Point, which is what they are doing. They had closed, you know, Top Thrill Dragster had closed for a variety of reasons, but now they, I mean, the name's a little lazy, Top Thrill 2, but they're doing a very different layout with, you know, like you mentioned, a forward, backwards, very high. What do you think about this? Them kind of taking something that was, you know, a launch and then a giant hill, you know, you know, super fast and tall and turning it into something still very high, but a bit different. Yeah, it's going to be quite different, actually. And um, so generally, I'm an optimistic guy, uh, as as I think you may have picked up on. I uh, am am a cheerleader for for the industry, an unapologetic cheerleader for the industry. I love parks and I love attractions and I love coasters. Um, That doesn't mean that I'm not critical when it, it's called for. Um, I have no fear of, of calling somebody or something out when, when it needs to. But my goodness, all, all of the, the negative noise about, oh my God, what are they doing to Top Thrill Dragster? I just think is silly. And like we were saying earlier about Splash Mountain, I think the moment Top Thrill 2 opens, all of that noise will go away. Because l- let's look at what we have here. Um, it used to be when it opened, it was the world's tallest, fastest coaster. We're talking about 420 feet tall, and it is uh, 120 miles an hour. So that's that's you know considerable. But it was a hydraulic launch system. The whole thing was over in a matter of seconds. You launched out of the station at an you know you hit that 120 miles per hour in no time flat. You went up this incredible spike. Yes, we're going to lose that um, that crazy launch, which was. The, the hydraulic launch system that Intamin was using, the, the coaster manufacturer was, you know, prone to downtime and, and had some problems. 
Um, instead, we're going to be having a magnetic launch system, and um, it will be similar. So it should be much more reliable, which is great. That's great. Who wants to go to a park and you, even though maybe you thought it was a great experience, you yeah. can't ride it. Uh, what's 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 the good in that? Yes, we're going to lose the fact that it'll go from zero to 120 miles per hour on the on a single launch. It'll be a swing launch system similar to how I describe what's going to happen with the flash vertical velocity, the the super boomerang. So you will launch forward. In this case, you'll launch forward kind of maybe three quarters of the way up that top hat, that 420 foot top hat, and then your everybody will experience what only a few people used to be able to experience. <laughs> Experience, which is a much coveted rollback. Uh, you're not going to make it to the top. The coaster is going to peter out and you're going to be dropping, I don't know, 300, 350 feet backwards. And, and then you're going to be launched at 101 miles per hour up a 420 foot spike that they're building backwards. Um, so you'll go up that spike backwards peter out and by the way that spike is at 90 degrees i mean you're just kind of staring straight down <laughs> 400 feet up in the air and then you're going to drop down again hit that uh that magnetic launch and finally with the momentum be able to get to 120 miles per hour and and then get the experience that you had with the original top thrill dragster of going up and over the top hat and coming around so I think it's only plussed. Is it the same? No, it's not the same. It's it's a different ride. Is it a better ride? I mean, until I get on it, you know, I can't really say. But I think potentially the experience is going to be better. I'm extremely excited about this. Um, and I think here in the States, this is the one to watch in 2024. This is the one that I'm most excited about. But again, like we said at the top, this is not really an entirely new ride. This is kind of a remake of an existing ride, but certainly uh, kind of quite different from from the original ride. Yeah, I'm intrigued by it. I think it looks looks more frightening, like you know, having to go forward and go backwards. Oh, that that's that's no joke. But I think it's going to be. I think it, assuming again that it mechanically does much better, it's going to be a real hit. Well, I'm going to finish with one last question that's open ended for you, Arthur. Sure. I've kind of led us through a lot of different rides come opening. Is there another new attraction or revamped attraction opening in 2024 that we have not discussed yet that you are excited about? Well, there's a couple maybe I, I could mention. Um, one is Iron Menace at Dorney Park, which is in Pennsylvania. Um, this is going to be a dive coaster. And for those who aren't familiar with a dive coaster, um, this particular one will go up 152 feet, which is nothing to sneeze at. There are actually taller dive coasters, but 152 feet, it will go over the precipice and uh, stare not just straight down, but at a 95 degree angle, so greater than than 90 degrees, and will stop. You just come to a complete stop, and you'll be looking down, and you're like, "Oh my <laughs> God, I've got 152 feet to go down at a 95 degree angle." And then finally, after a mere few seconds, but we'll, what will feel like an eternity. Um, there are quite a few dive coasters at parks around the country, around the world, but for the folks in Pennsylvania, this will be, you know, a, a major addition. Another one that's that's kind of intriguing is Ultra Splash at Six Flags over Georgia. That's a working name, by the way. They're gonna that that's kind of the name of the model of the coaster. This is interesting in that it's it's a U-shaped track. It's a shuttle coaster again not not it's not going to make a complete circuit instead it's going to go backwards and forwards on this u shape um with magnetic launches again um but what's interesting about this is in the middle each time as it passes through the middle it's going to go over a pool of water that will do something different each time you pass over it there'll be different water effects one of which is what they're calling a water vortex tunnel I don't know what that means exactly, but it sounds crazy. Like, you know, this this water swirling around the train, apparently. So those the, the, that sounds great. And also the coaster cars are going to spin at the same time. Oh so my gosh. You're going backwards and forwards at, at high speed. Um, you're going quite high up the spikes at either end of this U-shaped track, and you've got these crazy water effects happening while your car is spinning. So that sounds kind of nutty to me. Uh, and that's that may be a sleeper hit for, for 2024. Yeah, who's the brain that designed that? I mean, who the, I know, it's like, well, wait, what can we do? We could have like something. It's like out of Poseidon's Fury, where you walk through that water thing at Universal. It's like, what you're gonna put a car through? 
I don't know. I don't know, Arthur, but I I think both of those are exciting, and I know there's a lot more we haven't even covered, but hopefully this gives a good primer for people looking to figure out what is um, coming out. And like I mentioned at the start, I think another way is through your newsletter on Substack. So one more time, I'd love for people to know, and also if there's anywhere to follow you or social media or anywhere else, where could they go? Well, in terms of social media, I am on Twitter at About Theme Parks, A-B-O-U-T. I have to be careful with my Boston accent that I'm not sure how people (laughs) hear that, but it's About Theme Parks. And uh, likewise, um, my Substack newsletter, people can find me at aboutthemeparks.fun, F-U-N. There is a website, so people can just go and kind of peruse my articles if they want. But I I would hope that they would consider subscribing. Uh, There's a free version, which gets folks most of my content. And then there's a paid version. And that's the only way that I make any money at Substack is is from the paid subscriptions because there are no ads. And and again, um, the kinds of things that I'm writing... Certainly a lot of I'm writing a lot about the Disney parks, the Universal parks, the major parks, but also some of the smaller parks, roller coasters. I try to cover the entire industry because I love the entire industry. Um, I try to be a champion of, of some of the smaller, maybe under the radar parks sometimes, too. Um, but certainly a plenty of coverage about Disney and Universal. Folks can find me there and can subscribe. And uh, for, for an additional fee, um, they can get some of my uh, subs- paid subscriber only content, which uh, I, I have some great things that, that I do there as well. As, as I said earlier, because I'm not beholden to search engine optimization or to advertisers, you know, I try to just focus on the things that you and I and the people listening to this love, which is theme parks and accurate, honest uh, reviews and 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 journalism. So I, I I would hope that people will will join me and will consider subscribing. I'd be most grateful. And I thank you for the opportunity for me to come on today. It's it's been great. Oh yeah, this has been a blast, Arthur. Um, I feel like we scratched the surface. We did about ten percent of what's out there, and I, but it was super fun. And I would love to talk to you again sometime down the road. That'd be great. You, uh, you're you great at what you do. You're a wonderful interview, and I've, I've really enjoyed the time here. Well, that was a real bucket list item for me, getting the chance to talk to Arthur, who was so cool. And I know there are so many other new attractions opening in 2024 that we didn't even cover. Hyperia, a hypercoaster at Thorpe Park in the UK. We got Voltron at Europa Park. So many others around the world. I just knew that we couldn't hit on everything, but we covered quite a lot. So I would love to hear what are you most excited about in 2024. You can shoot me an email, dan at tomorrowsociety.com. Reach out on social media. We are everywhere, basically. Threads, Blue Sky, Twitter. We have a YouTube channel. There's plenty of places to reach out. It's always awesome to hear from you. I want to give a big shout out to my latest new member of the Tomorrow Society on Patreon. That is Mark Daryl. Thank you, Mark. It really helps to make a difference, especially as we move this show to being a weekly show. Any support that can be given is always awesome due to just the amount of extra work and everything else that's into it. I'm super excited to have this show coming out each week. If you'd like to help support the show on this venture, go to patreon.com slash tomorrow society to learn more. You can leave a small monthly contribution and get access to some really cool perks. Or if you'd just like to make a one-time contribution, you can buy me a Dole Whip. Go to TomorrowSociety.com slash Dole Whip to learn more. If you'd like to check out past episodes, there are 216 of them, if you can believe it. You can find them all wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, wherever, or go to TomorrowSociety.com slash podcast with an S at the end to learn more. The music that you are hearing right now was written by Adam Hookie, performed by the Sophisticated Babies. Next time, I'll be talking once again with Tim Grassi, the great podcaster from Marty Called. He's been on the show a bunch of times. We are going to talk about Epcot now that the transformation is mostly over. He recently got there and saw Luminous and Dreamers Point and everything else that's there. Journey of Water, the whole deal. Also wrote Tron for the first time. And then we're going to talk about looking at where Disney is now and where they are going forward with Tiana's, with the Tropical Americas, sort of announcement at Disney's Animal Kingdom, and a lot more. And we really dig into where we see theme parks going for Disney and beyond.
Thank you so much for listening to this episode with Arthur Levine. Definitely hope to have it back down the road in the future. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to this show, and I will talk to you again very soon.